Welcome to Minerva. Today we're going to be talking about the green children of Woolpit. First of all, I'd like to introduce my co-host Duncan. Hello. We hope to give you enough information that you can go away and then do your own study. So, different one for us. This is a yeah. traditional towel and it's all about the town of Woolpit, which is in Suffolk in England, which is near where you grew up. It is. Got a Norfolk of Suffolk on the coast there. That's me. Any green children while you were there? Uh, no, not really. No. <laughs> I think there's some ill circumstances, but no. And I mean, we spoke off camera before and you said you'd never been to Woolpit, but actually in the research that we've done, the word Woolpit means wolf's pit. Yep. And it's because wolves were prevalent in the area and they had to sort of trap them somehow. Uh, and that's how the, the town got its name. Um, there's a really interesting sign if you go to the town now, which I think was erected in the 1970s. It's a silhouette and it shows straight in the middle um, a building, which, are, which, is, which is a church, a local church. On the left hand side is the two children, mm -hmm. the two green children. And on the right hand side is a wolf. And I just think that encapsulates the feeling that this was a really big incident in that local town. I think it is the, the, the remaining thing that keeps it on the map. I mean, the, the thing I like, I mean, this is one of these wonderful things you sent me that I had no knowledge of, even though it was, yeah, it was pretty much on my doorstep childhood wise. And I thought I was, I was pretty knowledgeable, not an expert, but quite knowledgeable about the, the myths around my area. I never heard of these. Wow. And it is quite a significant one. Um, I mean, the other thing that was fun personally about looking into this is this concept that um, cinematically we hear about wolves and stuff like that. And we say yeah. wolves in England. But actually, like in my area of Norfolk, uh, there was such a concern of having wolves we really? actually well it is isn't it so if, if you're putting these wolves pits to catch wolves they weren't just there they were an issue so you and I'm, well in norfolk wolves <laughs> but uh, so there's that but um yeah i'd never come across this story so it's fascinating to look into no it was good to research so let's get into the story in the 12th century so a long time ago two children essentially arrived in Woolpit. Um, I believe there was a harvest going on and, and there were some people working on that and they found these two children. Now, the main thing and the main difference that has made this story what it is is the fact that when they found the children, they both had a green complexion. They looked green. Their skin was green. They also had very different clothing. Mm -hmm. Their clothing looked different to what everybody else was wearing and they couldn't quite work out where they had come from or it, it didn't look like it was from the time. And they also spoke a different language which, again, made it very difficult. They couldn't communicate with each other and also made them feel completely different. So starting with those basic facts of this story, where do you lean in as the sceptic of our, of our uh, panel? This is so unfair. Um, actually, no, it's good because it's a case of maybe it shows my naivety as well. But um, I actually believe it. Wow, okay. I actually, I know. It's, I know. Are you sitting different down? different for you. The, the reason... Be, um, we do have to go into more detail. I, um, if we're going to go down off the concept of aliens and stuff like that, obviously we're going to have a chat. That's coming. Yeah, that's coming. But the actual, the reason that I think there's sub, sub, some substantial substance to this is because of the simplicity of the story. Right. It's, we, I, I can't see any moral value in it to, in the sense of, you know, it's said for some, to, to convey some kind of story. Um, it's nothing like it's linked to, um, I mean, we say about harvest, it's not like there's a bad harvest and these two peculiar children came out of the, the woods. It's not about other stories we've heard you know, where there's children in the woods and they bring warning signs and then disappear. Right, yeah. We hear this account of these two children coming in. Um, they're identified, there's facts about them. Uh, nothing miraculous happens, mm. you know, there's no evangelical disappearing very into true. the heavens it's very simple but there's a clarity on the uniqueness which makes me think that now this is actually want of a better for, uh, for a word a, a historical account yeah um, and talking about the account there are two main sources that we get mm. this information from the first is ralph um of coggan Coggan Hall, yep. Coggins Hall, uh, who knew Sir Richard, who was the person that sheltered the children once they came in, because obviously they had to go somewhere, yep. these two young children. Um, and Sir Richard was the one that took them in. And Ralph gets his account directly from him. There's also William of Newborough, which is a long way away, yeah. who is said to 
give this account because he heard it from so many different sources and so many different people that he felt that he had to include it in his writings because it was a story that everybody had spoken about. Yeah. And he had heard some first-hand accounts as well in saying that this was something that really happened. Both of these men were members uh, of the church yeah. and both of these men important members in their communities. So it feels like we've got some reasonably good sources here. And I would have to support that. Uh, uh, I know normally I don't, because, but for the same <laughs> reasons that in other, uh, other things we've talked about, I've said, well, we can't accept it for this reason. One thing we have to understand uh, or, or appreciate is normally when we talk about things like histories uh, written in sort of like um, what we would still consider sort of like medieval early history, yeah. we use the word histories, but they're not actually as histories as we would describe them. Any histories that are written, they're normally written with a bias and with an intent to try to convey something. It's not like where, where we write histories where we try to knowingly give a series of historic events, even up until the 1800s. If someone said they wrote a history, it's still meant to be an idealistic idea. Yeah. And what they're writing, these two um, religious people, you know, religiously said, even as a knight, are not histories. They're not stories for the sense of entertain. They just write two accounts yeah. of a very of what they perceive as being facts. And because again, it doesn't go into anything mythical, that it's actually bizarre i mean one thing i would like to know is a sense of where were the sources was it a case of did he visit his friend and therefore was there and then got it from different people um which you know it's possible i mean if he was friends with sir richard then maybe he did visit you know i, I don't know i mean that's the part that i think is missing yeah there, there and there are some because this is such a long time ago yeah that there are some parts that are missing but to continue the story um one thing that i love is really makes me smile thinking about it is we're in the 12th century and anything that's not baptised has to be baptised. <laughs> yeah. So the children yeah. get instantly baptised. You know, we must baptise these children. Uh, so they do that. And the other big part of the story is about, is about food and about eating. And the children are obviously offered food when they, when they arrive and won't touch it. They don't want to go near it. Yeah. There's also, in some account, that they're almost hysterical and don't want to go anywhere near the food. And, the, and, and that was essentially bread and items like that. And over time, it is said that different people bring different foods. And eventually, the children jump when they see some broad beans. Very weird. Of course, they've got the green colour as well, so we can get into that later. <laughs> but apparently, the children don't even know how to eat them. They, 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 they recognise them, but mm. they can't get to the beans in the middle, and people have to show them how to almost peel them and get, and get the beans out so they can eat them. Um, and they essentially, this is what they eat. They, they eat the beans, and... The children start to uh, differentiate at this point, whereas the boy becomes more and more ill, mm -hmm. and the girl seems to get better and better. Yeah. Um, the girl starts to eat bread and starts to learn English um, and starts to really sort of involve herself in the community, and the boy doesn't, and he eventually dies, which is, you know, which is very sad. And so from that part of the story, is there, you know, is there anywhere else... What do you feel about the fact of the broad beans. And, I hate and that, and I, 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 yeah. I've never been a fan of broad beans. I still get served them and I have no idea why. So I can, I'm, I'm bemused at how the children can meet them. But outside of that, I think there's several points in which I think are quite fun to banter about. One in the sense of the baptism. Um, just as you were saying, this, uh, giving the account, I was trying to think, yeah, well, what is this obsession with either recording the baptism or doing it? And I just wonder if... Um, I wonder what the actual mindset of the town was like. I mean, we are talking about a time where we're looking at witchcraft, etc., oh, still yeah. being a thing. Yeah. And if they do have two, two green, I know we will react about how people are behaving, the two, even if, if they're different. We won't necessarily be um, negative towards, but there is always that risk. Yeah. And how are the children portraying themselves? Are they sure? So you wonder if the baptism wasn't done as a, a point of generosity or was it done as a case of, if you don't burn when we do this, we know you're safe sort of thing. But yeah. isn't it nice of us to do this? Yeah. Oh my God, they're fine, they're fine. Yeah. <laughs> they're not yeah. killing us. You wonder if, it, if that's that, you know, because um, I mean, we joke about the aliens things. But if we are going to go down different theories, would this, was it more of an act of testing or protecting themselves Rather than the the as we see it today, the um, the coming on of the Christ and making your choices for your for the next life sort of thing. And so making like maybe making the community feel 
more comfortable with the children as well. Yes, more than likely. I wonder if everybody shared the same opinion. Probably you know, not. <laughs> exactly. You know, yeah, it would be interesting. Even if in the sense of, um, if they were looking ill beforehand, would they, surely there would have been a sense of they're diseased. Yeah, I definitely. mean, you know, a sense of, is there an infection coming? Yeah. Would you have been so welcoming? It'd be, there'd be so many questions to ask, which is lovely when we talk about these sort of things where we're so far, we're talking about something so remote with so many little facts. It's enjoyable to put the human factor in of what would we do in this situation if two green children come in? Would we just go, hi, green beans, would you like so? So you look different. Yeah. We might like to do it in, a, in, in, this, in the social stance that we do. But the human action is going, this is weird. Yeah, uh, what do we do? Um, so I think that's one of the interesting parts to look at. The idea of the food, I mean, there's so many differences. We're both parents, and I know from my side, I've had to deal with children not wanting to eat. Me too. Um, and especially if we are looking at something that is, let's just say, not racially different, or so even alien racially different, I can quite understand that it's not implausible that... If the children are feeling threatened, if there's unfamiliar food being presented to them, no matter, we always say a child will, a child will eat when it's hungry, but yeah. if a child's scared, would they be so forthcoming? Mm. And maybe if someone showed that there's a bean, and uh, maybe they, their, father, their parents have showed, fed them the bean, but they've never said, so oh, I know that, I know it's safe, I'll eat that. Because, yeah. I mean, we're looking at a time where I'm sure foraging would have been a, a concept. And if they were with their parents, they would have gone foraging in the woods and they would be you eat that, you don't eat this. Yeah. That's safe, that's not safe. And so we don't know, really know the age of the sh children. They're talking, so there's an intellect that goes on. So someone more likely has spoken to them. And so maybe they have got this warning that not all food is safe food. And just because someone's given it to you and they don't know what they're saying, yeah. uh, and maybe they're just as scared, are they going to kill us because we're different? Um, so maybe the broad beans are said that's safe we can eat that and they'd never had to open it because their parents had done it for them and so i know it's safe but i don't know how to get it i think there's there's enough there again that gives enough weight for it to be true there's the idea of the baptism can have a different connotation which to be honest makes it more real than yeah. just um uh, an exercise done and there is a a rationale or you, you can put something that's conceivable in the sense of why a child would only eat something that's familiar especially if they've been taught don't eat stuff that's not familiar you don't know it, it could kill you okay so moving the story on the girl we know starts to eat the bread and she starts to get more involved in the community she starts to learn English um, when her brother dies and of course the minute she starts to learn English and the minute she's lost this green tinge to her skin people start to ask her where she comes from they start to inquire her backstory because now she can communicate with them and she explains that she comes from a place or a, a land essentially where the sun doesn't shine or not, not as brightly as it does where she is now she sort of imagines it as somewhere that's it's very hazy Mm -hmm. um, and it's quite dark, but there's there's a num there's like greenness around. She also calls it St Martin's Land in one of the um, in one of the uh, sources. Now, the story she tells is that she was essentially herding cattle for her father. Both of the children were, and they heard some bells in the background. They become hadn't heard these bells before, and they become quite excited about this noise and started to chase it and went into a cave and chased this noise through the cave, came out the other side and then just became essentially lost. The people then find her and then the story moves on from there. Yeah. This, ah, I'm assuming you're asking my opinion on this. Of course. Right, okay. I think there's several things to, to put in place. One again, uh, we're looking at, uh, we, we haven't defined and we do not know over what period of time we're looking at that's very true um and we we don't well so let's go says where we say when they're discovered when they're baptized do you know that could have, if we do it in the same way as we describe it, it says it was a safety thing that could have happened within the same hour sort of thing you know it's if it's an emergency coming on we think it's a safety thing the concept of eating um again we could talk about within the same day yeah 
um, obviously learning to speak English is not, but when the son, when the, the brother actually dies, we, we don't know if we're talking about months, if he suddenly becomes ill, or if, as where I'm getting at, that green colour of skin is from, as some writers have said, it's a, a food deficiency, yeah. that they haven't eaten. And therefore, what we, we can talk about and how we talk about it make it feel like months and months and therefore slowly transition to be human. Mm -hmm. Or if it's a case of it is a recovery. And although we only we hear about the brother's illness coming later, but yeah. what we could be seeing is first level of symptoms, the green skin. And when we're looking at them starting to eating, it's not sufficient. It's, we see the next stage of being ill, he falls into a deeper uh, coma like that, and he dies, you yeah. know, and so we could be looking at that. Um, and we actually know, there was, is it chlorosis, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, there's, um, uh, we know that there's a, a disease. It's actually called the green disease, yeah. which is a deficiency in your eating habits where your skin complexion will turn green. Yeah. And the few accounts we have of this story is about eating habits. Mm. And so we kind of start looking at that sort of, it, it seems to coincide, it's it not does. impossible. The next thing to do is how I annihilate the concept of if we're gonna go against you know, the aliens or, or things like that. We only know that the things like the clothes are different and that they speak a different language. They do, yes. Uh, and the other thing that comes in handy, we now have um, uh, a land called St. Martin's. Now, one thing we do know is where Woolpit is, we then have Bury St. Edmunds, and then above that, there's a place called um, a Fen Fenham St. Martins, right. which is like a small town village that's um, to the north. Okay. So well, I think we're looking at 20, 25 miles away, which is far enough that the term isn't familiar, but close enough where there it can be, if somebody is lost or tracked or comes away from, they can go from one to the other. Yeah. So then we have to address the question of the different languages and clothes. Now, one thing we know that happened uh, this, uh, around this time was there were immigrants and mercenaries from was it, um, yeah, Flemish. Flemish. Right? Yeah. And so they would have had a different style of dress, definitely had uh, a different language mm. that would have been in this location. And we also know that there was a battle there in around about the 12th century, um, that happened and it was persecution against the Flemish. And so suddenly where we're looking at green children losing, being lost in the woods, we started to seem to kind of get a course of events. Because the other thing we could have, I mean, I'm interested about these bells. And I'd be, uh, the thing we don't have is the age part. Because mm -hmm. did we hear bells or do we hear clashing of swords? Oh, okay. Do we hear metal against metal? Do we hear a cow bell? We think of ding, 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 yeah. ding as bells. But is that really what the child is describing? Or is they talking about metal hitting metal? Mm. Um, and being lost or, or, or taking the cattle away, are we, as parents, um, we we go, oh, look, we're being persecuted. Quick, children, hi, around here. Mum and dad are going to try and fend off these people. Or would it be a case of, uh, look, uh, do you go and take the things? We will be with you. Just wait for us. Keep going in that direction. We will catch up with you. Mm. And mum and dad never catch up. And although I know they say they go towards the bells, we are talking about the daughter. Was the, the brother the leading uh, character in it? Okay. Uh, in the sense when the food is provided, we don't know what the language exchange was. Was the, the brother being now being the father or being the masculine one say, so, oh, like, don't eat this, this isn't familiar. These are the little human aspects we don't have in the story. But the, fam the, the familiarity of St. Martin's, St. Martin's, and the other thing, I mean, I don't know the area, but if it's, if it's called Fenham, there's more likely gonna be a Fen. And from experience, the Fens in Cambridge, Norfolk, and that would say, it's generally, I mean, there's a, a lovely place, it's out in the marshes, you've got the, uh, the fence where for great times of year when you didn't have the pollution of people living there, you would have thick mist right. virtually all the time. And so if a child is recollecting their childhood, waking up to thick mist, it seems again to coincide with what's being described by the child. Yeah, the child also, or certainly the girl also describes um, St. Martin's Land as having being surrounded by water as if you can't get they, they could see things past the water but they couldn't ever get there yeah. and of course when we look at the um the geography of, of st martin's 
there is a big river. So all of these things are linking up um, quite nicely. But let's, there are many theories out there, many, yeah. many theories. Um, one of the big ones, one of the ones that you'll see online often is about aliens. <laughs> Can't wait. Before I pass that over to you, pretty... <laughs> Pretty, Just pass it by. It'll be fine. I'm pretty confident of what you're going to say. I can imagine this is this is born out of the fact that we have little green men, yeah, and the two children are little and green, and the fact that these that they just appear from from nowhere. However, there doesn't seem to be, and I don't think there would be in the sources any link to aliens because I don't think they were thinking about extraterrestrials yeah. in the 12th century. It would be far more along the lines of fairies. It would be far more along the lines of uh, of monsters and kind of goblins and things like that. That there would be scared of they you know, they weren't far reaching enough to talk about extraterrestrials at that point um i do wonder if this is a folklore tower though i wonder if this is a, a folklore tower that is given some some sort of moral perspective or some allegorical perspective uh, you shock me sir <laughs> uh, i can't think of one myself um uh, but there's the, there is that concept of one thing that's not in the story of the accounts is going back to there's not the shock of the village. Mm. So there does seem to be, there's not even, I mean, you would have had, uh, they would have been, there's a likelihood they'd still be aware of Celtic gods. Yeah. Not following, but they would have been like Sinanis or um, uh, Hearn the Hunter. The idea, the green man in the woods. We still have him on pub signs. Yeah, we do. And so to have green children coming in, even if uh, we have, there's no rhetoric that's supporting that idea. Even if there was a moral story, and you've got erudite people like the knight and the uh, the clergyman writing about it, neither of them try to make a twist on old gods being, you know, once he was baptized, she became, you know, human. So unless you can think of, well, I think that's right, but. One of the things I did read from a researcher was that this was about, again, going on your Flemish line, the, these children uh, are Flemish, but it's about the racial difference between people. And of course, the boy seems to come in and, and not, not get involved culturally. He doesn't want to learn the English, doesn't learn English, and doesn't eat oh, um, right. the bread, etc. would only eat the beans that he's used to, whereas the girl does get more involved in the community. And of course, she is accepted in that sense, and he isn't because he dies. And yeah. I, you know that was one of the theories that, that I heard, which I found quite interesting. I think another theory is about, and this is this is my probably my favourite um, theory, is that these are cave dwellers. Now I think they're probably again Flemish. I think that makes a lot of sense. But I do wonder if these were children that were kept quite strictly in a cave by their parents. Mm again for many reasons could be the walls could be lots of other things that we talk about um and they're only let out at certain times of the day where the sun is is low to do harvesting or to go and get food and that type of thing and of course if they're aware of this river and not anything past it it does feel like they're very localized right yeah so that's that's probably my favorite theory in that and again would make sense that the parents may be left to battle left the children there and of course they don't come back and they don't know where to go but one other, I think, one last one to talk about, and it goes along the lines that you were talking about earlier with this um, green disease. There was an incident in America not too long ago of a green, uh, sorry, of a blue man, a man that was had a blue complexion, and he met somebody and copulated with them and had children, and half of the children were blue, and then they went on and had some children as well and produced blue children as well, and, and nobody in this local, very small town in America understood what was happening. They eventually the children eventually speak to the local university and sort of say we don't understand why we're blue we don't we've got this <laughs> tinge to our skin it's weird um and they they do some research and find out it's basically just uh, an oxygen an oxygen deficiency um the man the original blue man had um when when he had when he had found his partner he didn't realize because she was of of caucasian skin but he didn't realize that she had that gene and it's like a one in a billion chance that she would wow. have that and those two would be able to make a blue child nobody else so it, it's it's a very very strange thing um but that happened in america and again something that's maybe worth us talking about in the future yeah. but certainly worth people going and researching um and i do wonder if there is one of those types of deficiencies here yeah well that's it i mean um if it is a generic thing and it's nothing imposed by environment, then if someone can go blue, it, yeah, it, it seems very much a, a, an option. 
Um, but if it's chlorosis, um, actually called the green disease, seems to be the actual one, uh, if that fits. Um, I again, it goes down the sense of, would it be so unnatural? Maybe the reaction from the, um, the villagers or the town people, they were slightly familiar with the green. Maybe it was more extensive because they've been so deficient. Yeah. And so the concern is, are they going to survive? We don't have these sort of accounts in. I mean, the, um, you're going down the moral sense. Uh, was there a moral story to it? And I suppose we were going on the, the cusp of, was it showing that it is better because the because uh, the sister interacted mm. with the culture, therefore that is the better thing to do, and so therefore she lived and the other one died. I swear they could. I'm surprised then if the especially from the um, the, the cleric's perspective, he didn't add as because she had bread, the body of Christ. It was the saving grace. Um, I don't know if there's that hint in the text or not. I mean, if you were going down those lines, then maybe there is a, a moral aspect. But if we did do that, then we are, we would have to put into the question, is it really true? Because it has yeah. a moral value. The fact that we don't seem to see it so evidently put in the text, which would have been in around the 12th century, where you have things... Uh, um, uh, the fair is it the fair no, it's later. But you have enough allegorical poems yeah. to have a structure and it doesn't seem to fit those. It does seem to be an account more than anything else. But she did she got the other part that I love about the story is a case of again, she doesn't disappear. No. The her her afterlife part I mean she had she ended up having to admire us or something, didn't she? Yeah, so as she uh, blossoms as as a young female, everybody seems to be quite attracted to her by by the story, including Sir Richard. Um, however, a man does win her hand uh, from King's Lynn, which is within the area, but not oh, yeah, too it's, close. It's, it's not close. Um, and, she go, and she goes with him, marries him, and lives with him, and renames herself as Agnes. And I did listen to um, a wonderful uh, podcast on this, and the person said that there was a link here, because the person from King's Lynn was uh, part of royalty. It was part of the, the British bloodline. Oh. And there is said to be a small tinge of green within <laughs> the British uh, bloodline, apparently. Ah. So that's something that I now want to go and look at a little bit further. And again, if you've heard of this, in the, yeah, please do pop that in the comments. I'd be fascinated to learn a bit more about that. Wouldn't it just, wouldn't it? But I think it's been a great one to talk about. Yeah. Really, really interesting. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a very old tale. But, and again, if there are any more of these types of things, please do pop them in the comments so that we can pick them up and, and do other episodes on them. Sounds a plan. Fantastic. Well, please do like and subscribe. It really helps the channel. And we look forward to seeing you again very soon.